Well, this is, we get to talk about graduation. And where did she go? Oh, there she is. Back with her homies over there. So I don't get, I get to embarrass her. Maybe I can just walk down and talk to her. I was, I was putting this together the other day and I, I was thinking about how many of you remember your graduation? <laughs> yeah. It, I know, so long ago, right? How many remember your high school, your college graduation, maybe a couple of decades ago or a couple of millennia ago? Okay, maybe you remember your kid's graduation more than you remember your own. This is an opportunity, the time we have to bless our graduates, send them off to the next phase in their life with the blessing of God. We want to encourage her. I'm, I'm, even though she's still going to be here, it's a big transition for her. She's going from Dover. How many students were in Dover? How many students were in Penn State? A lot more. Yeah. <coughs> High school was no picnic, at least spiritually. College is even worse on a spiritual basis. And we just want to encourage you that once you're there, you know, there's a statistic that says about 85% of the kids raised in church walk away from God in college because there's such a negative influence there. Now, we know you're, not, you're going to be one of the 15% that stick around. And you're also going to be one of the ones that really have a positive influence on the people you come in contact with. Bertrand Russell once says, I was born in the wrong generation. When I was a young man, no one had any respect for youth. And when I was old, no one had any respect for age. How many think that's still true today? <laughs> but in this church, we have tremendous respect for young people. We love you, we appreciate you, and we want you to be everything God wants you to be. The truth is, seniors, or senior, <laughs> is and will be the leader of this church or some church at some point. You'll be the business owners, entrepreneurs, workers, teachers of tomorrow, and they're all pointing to each other. You are now adults, right, Paul? Yeah. And the decisions you make now will determine the rest of your life, some of them. Some of them may be so tremendous that the rest of your life is based on one decision you're going to make today. And college, post high school, is the greatest adventure of your life. You're going to think that in college, it's the hardest time. But once you get out, all of us who are now out of college and not out in the work, wish we were back because it was easier than life. But we would only go back knowing what we know now. Because if we go back knowing what we knew then, we would do the same stupid things we did then. Now this is a time your parents have waited for as well. They've spent the last 18 or so years preparing for you to leave. And now they are happy that you're not. Now the only one that might not be happy about that is Chris because he wants your room. <laughs> in the book of Ecclesiastes, written by Solomon, the wisest man in the world, says this, don't let the excitement of youth cause you to forget your creator. Honor him in your youth before you grow old and, are no, and no longer enjoy living. <laughs> you know, think about that for a minute. I want to know what age that is when we no longer enjoy living. 50? Who said 50? Because <laughs> it says in verse 2, it will be too late then to remember him. I'm kind of thinking that might be like 100. He said to young people, remember God in your younger years because that will determine who you are going to be as an adult. These are the most important times because these are the times that you're making decisions that will affect the rest of your life. Things that, as an adult, you can't really go back and change. 
because of what you've done now. Ask any adult, and they would probably tell you that they, if they can go back and change something, they would. How many of you would like to do that? Pretty much every hand goes up. There are three things, well, only three things I'm talking about today because I only have an hour and a half, so, or 10 minutes, whichever comes first. <laughs> three things to remember, and this is for adults too. Priorities, integrity, and attitude. Priorities. Deuteronomy 6.5 says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. Exodus 23, 19, bring the best of the first fruits of your soil to the house of the Lord your God. First fruits, the first thing that they raised, the first thing that they were able to offer was what God wanted. Not seconds, not thirds, the very first thing that God wanted was the first thing they grew. God always requires the first of everything. What is first in your life? What's your number one priority? If you're going to college, and I know it's not you, but the number one priority for a lot of college folks is to be away from mom and dad. The number one priority is to go have a good, good time. Or maybe your number one priority is to become famous, become someone important. Maybe your number one priority is to make money. Those are all okay, not a bad priority, but they can't be your first priority. What is your number one priority? Your priorities will dictate what you do. What you value is what you're gonna do. Not even things you like, but what's your priority? Obviously, Katie's priority was to be involved. Where's that list? You know, when I typed this list up, I almost had to make it two sheets because you just weren't involved in enough things. Number one priority, obviously, should be the Lord. If you have him first, whatever falls second and third will fall into place. As we mentioned earlier, we're going on vacation this week. Pray for us. We're driving to Florida. After God being first in my life, what's my priority this week? Get the car ready. Change the oil, get everything ready to go. What's Anna's priority? Everything else. <laughs> Packing for me, Walmart bag, three minutes, I'm ready. Packing for them, started yesterday. And the lists and the itinerary, it's, it's kind of like a wedding. <laughs> the guy just shows up. <laughs> Number one priority for me is what's going to dictate what I do this week. Number one priority for you will dictate what you do for your life. To make this trip successful, I have to have my priorities and I have to follow them. After God being first, what's your second, third, and fourth priority? If your goal is to succeed as a Christian, put God first. Many people believe that putting God first in your life means checking your brain at the door. In reality, a detailed analysis of Christian faith shows just the opposite. It requires great intellect and great knowledge to have faith. I was able to teach the class this morning in here, and so I kind of taught them what we're teaching the teenagers about uh, what do you believe, why you believe what you believe. 
And Lee Strobel, the author of the book that we're talking about, says this, taken together, I have concluded that this expert testimony constitutes compelling evidence that Jesus Christ was who he claimed to be, the one and only Son of God. The atheism I embraced for so long buckled under the weight of historical truth. Being a Christian today demands not just a cursory knowledge of Christian things. It requires a deep understanding of what God's word really says. You can't just have a God's promise book and that's it. Those are great. But as Christians, whether you're going to college, whether you're an older Christian, God requires a deep understanding of who he is, not just something that you heard about in church somewhere. That's what it means to put the Lord as number one, to really know who God is. Get ready. When boys come, and all their heads go like this. At that time, now remember, God first. Boys. But there will eventually be some guy that God sends in your way that gets your attention. What will happen at that moment is you'll want to know everything there is to know about this guy. Every little detail, every little idiosyncrasy will just make you think he is the best thing. Well, they never pass that. Well, they almost never pass that test. Well, we, that one does. That one passed the test. <laughs> but because you want to know him, you want to know about him. You want to find out all the things about him because you want to have a relationship with him. You don't just meet him and find out nothing about him. You want to know more about him because you want that relationship. A Christian wants the relationship, which means you know and you want to know more about who God really is. The second thing, I'll try to go a little quicker. Integrity. Proverbs 22.1 says, A good name is more desirable than great riches. It is to be esteemed better than silver or gold. Your character or integrity is who you are when no one's looking. Who you are on the inside. It's not so much what people see. It's but how do you act if no one's around? Are you the same in your house as you are in public? Well, are you two different people? Or are you consistent no matter who you're with? Do you treat one set of friends differently than you treat another set of friends? Are you willing to suffer for the sake of your integrity? Because your integrity will follow you long after you're out of college It'll follow you all of your life. Are you willing to suffer for the sake of your integrity? It means doing the right thing even if you have to endure hardship because you do it. Your word needs to be absolute. You will become in the future what you are right now. Is your integrity intact? In your school, are you seen as a person of integrity? Character or integrity is not something you can get later on. It follows you. As you've probably heard, it's on your permanent record. You can't automatically at some point be thought of as a person of integrity or character if you've not been that up to that point. You can't change who you are at some later date. Instantly. You have to cultivate integrity now. John Maxwell, the leadership training guy, says this. He says, when I have integrity, my words and my deeds match up. I am who I am, no matter who I am with or where I am. He calls integrity the single most ingredient, important ingredient of leadership. Without integrity, he says, you will never succeed in what you want to accomplish. 
Now, I know what the answer to this one is, but I'm going to ask it anyways. If I were to go back and ask your teachers what kind of person Katie Jones was, what would they tell me? Dude, you don't want to know. <laughs> they would probably gush all over you, correct? Yes, they would. That's integrity. What people say about you after you're gone. The last one is attitude. Philippians 4.10 says, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you have renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you have been concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what, if, what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do everything to him who gives me strength. What's your attitude? Let me ask you a question real quickly. Think of a person that you admire. Doesn't have to be famous. Does any person that you admire? Got him? What's the one thing about them that you like, that makes you admire them? When this, question is, when this same question is asked to any crowd of people, 95% of the responses have something to do with the person's attitude. Not their accomplishment, but their attitude about their life. Chuck Swindoll says life is 10% of what happens to you and 90% of how you react to it. We all know people who have had hard lives. It just seems, you know, they, it seems to be unfair almost to their life. And they have continuing hardships. But yet some of them continue to have joy and an upbeat attitude regardless of the situation. Their attitude enables them to overcome their obstacles. Any medical professionals? How does attitude weigh into recovery time? Big difference, I've been told. A person's attitude greatly enhances their ability to overcome any kind of surgery or operation. Walter Emerson says, what lies behind us and what lies before us are but tiny matters compared to what lies within us. What's your attitude? Are we always negative and we're the person that nobody wants to be around? Or are we always upbeat in spite of the circumstances that we face? Are you the kind of person that you would want to hang out with? Robert Half, he's a business consulting company, says the single greatest reason for firing an employee is attitude. It's not competency, it's not ability, it's attitude. Carnegie Institute concluded that a person's success was due to 15% training, 85% attitude. You alone are responsible for your attitude. We can't blame situations. We can't blame what is going on. We have the ability, especially as Christians through Christ, to have an upbeat attitude in spite of what's going on. If you keep your attitude up and your hope in the Lord running high, you can overcome anything. Now, I've said this before, and you've probably heard me say it. You can live four weeks without food. Well, maybe not this crowd, but. <laughs> you can live four days without water, four minutes without air, but only about four seconds without hope. Your attitude is the single most important factor in determining your success. Do you have a can-do attitude or do you have a can't-do attitude? As you begin this new exciting walk, woohoo, remember three things. Keep your priority on Christ. If you place your trust in Him, you can be assured of spiritual success, which translates also into professional success. Keep your integrity. Don't lose your integrity over something that's fleeting, something that will happen and, and change your life forever. 
once integrity is lost, it's very difficult to get it back. Now, I've used this example before, but if you've not been here, when I say the, the name Richard Nixon, what do you think? Watergate. A single event in his political career. Everyone forgets everything else he ever did, good or bad. I don't think he's ever gained any semblance of respect or integrity since then. When was that, 73, 74? Do you know that in years gone by, surveys would always show preachers at the top of people they trust. But not anymore. After some very public failures and some ridiculous teachings that are out there, preachers are now near the bottom. Because sometimes others' lack of integrity also affect you. And our lack of integrity could affect somebody else. You know who's only one person below us on the integrity list? Politicians. Why do you think they're on the bottom of the list? Because people assume they have no integrity, no character, because of things that they have done. Not all of them, but they're all lumped together because of the actions of some. That goes to also who we hang out with. You may be totally innocent, but others that you hang out with through their lack of integrity could also affect you. Now the Bible says we're to be friends with everyone. We're not to you know, cloister ourselves in here. We're not monks, we don't have a monastery. We're to be, interact with the world but also says we're not to be unequally yoked. That means your best, most intimate friends should be believers, should be people of integrity. And we should have that same attitude towards others, that we wanna be a person of integrity to help them. Keep your attitude up. Every part of your life will probably not go as you are planning it to go. You may even hit some difficult times. Times when you want to quit. Who's been there? It's at those times that your attitude keeps you going. Paul writes this in 2 Corinthians 1. He says, we do not want you to be uninformed brothers about the hardships that we suffered in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure so that we despaired even of life. Indeed, in our hearts we felt the sentence of death. But this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. Paul could have quit at that moment. He could have just given up. But his attitude and his faith are what kept him going. Many of our greatest leaders today have had failures and setbacks and hard times because failures and setbacks are not necessarily sin. It's how we react to those failures and setbacks that determine what happens after that. The one scripture that we're gonna close with today, it's easy and we most, I bet you to say most of us know it. If God is for you, who can be against you? If God is number one and he is for you, nothing can bring you down if God is first. Amen. Would you stand as we close this morning? If you would close your eyes and bow your heads for a moment.
This is a, a joyous milestone that we get to celebrate today. And we are excited to see what is in the future for Katie. And we pray that God pours his Holy Spirit upon you and fills you to overflowing. That you are able to affect great and mighty change in the places where you go. That same principle also applies to each one of us. And the most important decision we can ever make, the most important choice that we can ever make is to trust Christ. If you're here this morning and you've never done that, you've never really come to the point where you've said, Jesus, I believe that you died for my sin. I've never said, Jesus, I need you to forgive me of my sin. But you know in the back of your mind that you have to do that. And you're not here by accident, you're here by divine purpose. From the beginning of the service through now, God is working in people's lives to accomplish His will. If you're here and you've never accepted Jesus, you're here to do that this morning. If you want to do that, you want to make the choice to trust Jesus, I want you to raise your hand right now. All right, I'm going to assume that all of us are committed followers of Christ. And all these points we, we kind of address to Katie as she makes this transition, we know in our hearts that all these apply to us as well. That as adults, we have to keep our priorities straight. We have to continue to, to withhold and uphold our integrity. And we have to continue to have a great attitude about what God is in charge of. Father, I thank you for instilling that in each one of us. We thank you for your word that encourages us in all of these areas. And Lord, I pray now that you would fill each person here with the Spirit of God, that you would fill us with that desire to put you first in everything, to trust you, let our faith increase as we trust you for everything. You're number one, Lord. Nothing is more important than you. And Father, in order to continue to keep you first, we pray that our integrity stays intact. That the choices and decisions we make today are one that you'd be pleased with, are ones that we know would honor you, that we do the right thing, even when it's, it's the difficult thing, and allow us to live our lives being the most integrity-filled person we can be so that our character reflects the goodness of God. And Lord, I pray maybe even for the hardest one that you continue to give us an upbeat attitude. Let the Holy Spirit fill us with your joy and your peace. And as we trust you, Lord, and know that you are in control, you're number one, our attitude can be great because we know our God is in control. Regardless of what we may see in front of us, God, you're still in control. I pray your blessings upon each one of us as we leave this morning. Allow us to be encouraged, allow us to be challenged, and allow us to have our lives be changed by you. Father, we commit Katie on this journey to you. And we commit each one of us on the journey to continue to love you the best that we can. And Father, I commit each one here to you in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Have a blessed week. We will see you on Wednesday. I know. And Sunday. <laughs>